earlier this week, we had the opportunity to do like a test retest sort of scenario for someone. And I think that that's going to be really useful for people because most of the people that are listening to something like this are aware in the course of being pre prescribed a medication, it's kind of like sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. That's the experience that a lot of people have and there's a trade-off. So anytime that we use something exogenous or external, um, we have to trade off between like, well, what is it going to give me and what is the thing it's going to take? Because obviously if it was just the way my body ran, I wouldn't need it. But we have a good window into that today. So we have someone at 29, they had previously been diagnosed with hypertension or high blood pressure and thought like, we all, it was everybody here is like, you're high blood pressure. You think we got to get that down. Um, sometimes we don't pay attention to why we got to get it down, but normally it's because somebody's at a risk of stroke. And to fight off the risk of stroke, a lot of times it seems worthwhile for people to bring that blood pressure down. But what we're not taking into account is that in any young person, why is the heart rate, or excuse me, the blood pressure high to begin with? That's a useful question. So in this particular case, that happened to be part of the history for someone who is having symptoms of POTS. And with those POTS symptoms, I'm feeling a lot of things that are very much in the hypoperfusion range, right? So brain fog, lightheaded, all of these things, dizziness, nausea, et cetera, et cetera, right? All the stuff that makes you feel like you're bogged way down. So what we did was had a quick look at what's going on from a from just like an orthostatic perspective. Basically what we're looking at here, I break it down like this to explain to people because it's kind of an easy way to visualize it, but we can see over here, all the, the non-shaded part is someone laying down. And then when in this gray area, then this is kind of like when we're tilted and then this bottom part of white is where we're laying back down again. So 70 degree tilt, 10 minutes, and we're looking at, sure enough, we see this baseline heart rate around 72, and then immediately in that first minute, we're popping up to 102, and then it kind of settles back in in the 80s, 80s, and then into the 90s, 87. So the deltas are, you know, 41% in the beginning, and then in the kind of the 20-ish range, uh, they're at 20% range thereafter. And then we look at the blood pressure. Blood pressure is high. So, you know, like 148 over 90. And then when we're on a tilt, 151 over 83, 147 over 98. Um, and it kind of stays in that, you know, 140s over upper 80s, 90s range. Cool. And from there, we can see that so this is like a little bit high. So then we come down here and we look at the medications. We're on Eliquis. And then it's been about 24 hours since the last dose of metoprolol. So for those of you that know, you know. But if you don't, metoprolol, it's a medication that is used as a beta blocker. It's one of them. There are a few different ones. Metoprolol is one of them. It is unique because it's a like a beta-1 adrenergic receptor blocker. A lot of words there, but it just means it only affects a certain type of, of the beta adrenergic receptors. What we're saying is, is like normally taking that metoprolol as a way to decrease this blood pressure, right? And without it, we can see it kind of drifting back up into these higher numbers. So mean arterial pressure is kind of over 100. Um, and so it's like it's creeping up. And then the question kind of becomes why, right? So we slide over here and we realize that the perfusion rate when we're laying down, left side's about 62. This is using the transcranial Doppler, by the way. So we're measuring middle cerebral artery blood flow using the middle cerebral velocity. Centimeters per second is our is our metric, okay? Or that that's our nomenclature. So we're starting at 62 and 60 as a baseline. And then when we tilt people up, we want it to basically stay there, right? And we know how efficient that hemodynamic system is based on how close it can get to that baseline number. And you can see the bolds here, those are highlighted because they're kind of below where we want them to be based on normals, okay? And so you can see that we're, all, we're in this little bit of a pickle where our blood pressures are up, but the blood pressure in the brain or the cerebral perfusion pressure is low. So that doesn't seem right, right? And then we're getting the subjective symptoms that, that are being complained about, dizziness, shortness of breath, 
doesn't feel right, lightheaded, etc. Okay. So if we think about, if we just stop for a second and go, what in the heck is going on here? You realize that we're not getting a normal transfer of this high blood pressure from the body being transferred into the brain, which means that we're somehow restricting the, the flow as it comes through the carotids and actually into the skull. That's super important, right? Okay. So we had this conversation. We talked about, you know, those, that's a thing that we want to pay attention to. And then we said, you know, what we might want to take a look at though, is what changes when you use the, when you use the metoprolol, because the thought would be that it should decrease the blood pressure. But when I look at that, I say, hmm, if we're already having a hard time converting a high blood pressure into normal blood flow velocity in the brain, what's going to happen when we go back on the medication and then we drop that blood pressure? Because now it's even harder to get blood flow into the brain. So what I was concerned about was that if we go back on the medication, resume it as normal, then actually these symptoms are, are potentially going to be worse because of their relationship to the hypoperfusion. So we're basically saying, all right, we got high blood pressure. It's not transmitting into brain blood pressure. What is going on here? So what we did was we went back on the medication. And then with the medication, we want to see, does it make it better? What happens with the blood pressure? What happens to perfusion pressure? What is going on here? Okay. So let's look at that. This is the same test. So we see here, original one was 5.5, this one's 5.28, so it's 23 days later. We're back on metoprolol. Last dose was 90 minutes ago. This is a morning test, okay? So this is early, same time for both of these. And here's the part that I think is super useful. When we look at this, we see that this blood pressure is coming down. So we're not crazy low. But we're lower, if we look at the mean arterial pressures here, our baseline is about 10 points lower than when we started out last time. So it does have the effect of bringing the blood pressure down. That was kind of the intended purpose. But if we look over here, what becomes really interesting is from just an observation, again, this is all just observation, but I think the observation is worth the exercise. We observed that it was much harder to actually acquire the reed this time. So to actually insinate, find the insination of the, of the vessel. So that's number one. Number two was it was actually our, our ability to be able to get that was much lower. So our mean, our baseline number was a lot lower. But then we found, okay, well, maybe we just missed it and we, you know, we made an error here. But when we compare the vessel to itself, which is what we're doing, we see that we see a more significant drop of the cerebral perfusion pressure, right? The cerebral blood flow velocity in this instance. So the numbers go down even more, especially as time goes on. So they start low, they come up for a couple of minutes, and then they start dropping pretty precipitously in the eighth and 10th minutes. And then we see we actually were, were unable to hold the value here as we started getting into the teens. So the numbers were getting low enough to where they weren't picking up on the machine. And then they, again, in these last two minutes, they start dropping pretty hard. So, and, and similar types of subjective symptoms where we've got dizzy and lightheadedness, we've got brain fog, etc. So what I think is a good takeaway from this is we're not saying like, take meds, don't take meds. That's not really the moral of the story. It's not my role in the world. But what is useful is considering how these dynamics work. And if you kind of think about them logically, it makes a lot of sense. So if we get on a medication that is going to do two things, metoprolol tends to do a couple of things. I guess I didn't really talk about that. Number one, it's meant to kind of block the, the sympathetic nerve signal. So we got a couple of them coming in, coming down. They start from the IML and the cord. They come to the heart. And basically this medication blocks them at the SA node, which is what controls our heart rate, blocks it at the AV node, so we kind of suppress it. So that's gonna bring the heart rate down. That's kind of the job. You can see that that happens here. The heart rate is lower during the orthostatic stress, right? And then as a consequence, we get lower blood pressure. It also does a job, because it only affects the beta ones, it also affects what's called inotropy, which is basically the contractility of the heart, like how hard 
the heart can contract. It kind of slows that down so it actually doesn't contract as hard, which is kind of paradoxical because what it does is it decreases the cardiac output because it's not pushing as hard, even though it's going to fill a little bit more because the heart has more time between beats. So I'll say that again. The heart has more time between beats because the heart rate is slower. And if the heart rate is slower, that means the heart is going to fill up with blood a little bit more. But the amount of squeeze, right? How hard that heart is squeezing is going down. So actually the cardiac output can kind of be blunted a little bit as well. And we're seeing that here by taking that heart rate down, we see the blood pressure drop a little bit. And then we see the cerebral perfusion pressure drops even more than it was uh, without the medication. So in this case, what I think we can really take away from this is looking at the fact that we have the capacity, we're not, we don't have to just guess on what a medication does in a lot of ways, especially when we look at hemodynamics. We can look and see, does it have the intended outcome? Now, in this case, the intended outcome was kind of trying to suppress blood pressure, but at what cost? One thing to consider is that there's a possibility that blood pressure is elevating because blood pressure in the brain is dropping. So how can I, how can I get more blood to the brain? I can increase my blood pressure. And while my resting pressure is going to be higher, I may be able to get more into the brain and actually be able to function. And then if I take that compensation away and I say, heart, you can't beat fast and we can't raise that blood pressure, then we're going to see the perfusion pressure is going to suffer. So the cerebral perfusion is going to go down. Symptoms are going to get worse. And I would argue that hypoperfusing the brain is over the long term, perhaps even more dangerous because we're kind of like extending that that period of, of, of injury and also reducing quality of life during that time frame. So again, takeaway for me, when we're testing people, we want to understand, does the medication do what we think it's doing? And is it solving the right problem? A lot of people will notice that like medication isn't, their particular medication isn't useful for them. And they notice it doesn't make them feel good. And then it's kind of like, then what? Or it's unknown. And is it as having the positive effect on the thing we want it to affect or not? So Moral of the story is we have the ability to be able to check and see if these things are doing what we want. Maybe we could use it and then we can test and then retest the outcomes of the medication and see if it's handy or not. Um, if that's kind of the model you want to use. We take a different approach. We say we're going to test, retest, trying to train brain. But you can see how there's a parallel here. And we're actually, this person's been being pushed for years kind of in the wrong direction. Um, so with this bit of knowledge, now we can start to think about how do we solve this problem in a different way. Double H asked, can there be a blockage in the neck area that's not helping blood get to the brain? Fantastic question. And that is in some cases, that is the problem, right? And actually we had a different case today where that was in fact the problem. Um, in this particular case, you can see when we're checking this cervical range of motion with a Doppler, that we don't see a significant change with the movement of the head which would indicate that perhaps there's something going on in the neck. If it's just in the neck itself, when we tip people up, there's no real change, right? It's because it's not changing. So the way that we stress that is by having people move their neck and see how that affects blood flow in the brain. So really good question there. We also actually do it by raising arms over the head uh, as well. Some of the times that is the case. And sometimes I'll be like, that's got to be what's going on. And then we do the test. I'm like, nope, that wasn't it. And we just keep plugging away and keep hunting for the problem. Double H says it's very useful as you figure out that there's a reason for the high blood pressure. I think so. And this is one that has just been on our radar a little bit lately because we've had a few patients like that um, where they're without any, you know, meaning to do it by solving the high blood pressure problem, we end up making the, high, the perfusion problem even worse. And then a lot of people will be on a different medication. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch this over here. A lot of people will be on a different medication, such as like propanolol. Propanolol is a little bit different. It's also a beta blocker. Um, but propanolol, so it's not a selective blocker, meaning it just goes to all the adrenergic cells. So now it's affecting a whole bunch of stuff. So now it affects your heart, affects your blood vessels, affects uh, glycemic responses. It affects also different changes in the cerebral perfusion, and then also cerebral vasoreactivity. reactivity. So now like something like propanolol, we have to look at even closer because it's affecting all of these different things. Um, it makes it a little bit harder, even though that one's more common to give to people with POTS. It's worth noting that I'm not making any recommendations on medications here. We're just making observations about what we see um, relative to what we're testing.